Jamie will be speaking instead uh, from Queensland Corrective Services and talking about predictive factors in attempted and completed suicides in Queensland Correctional Facilities. Thanks for having us along to speak today. Um, so, as, um, as you said, uh, my name is Jenny Bell. I'm the current manager of research and evaluation at Queensland Corrective Services, and here with my director um, research, of research and evaluation and performance, um, Sandy Saker. So, we have a small research and evaluation team at QCS. Um, we conduct a range of research activities including internal evaluations and research around QCS programs and initiatives. We contract out external research projects, um, as well as facilitating access to QCS data for external researchers. But we also do have some capacity to conduct research projects on area of particular interest to QCS, but also to the wider criminal justice system. Um, so this project we are presenting today is one of those. The study is titled um, Predictive Factors and Attempted and Completed Suicides in Queensland Correctional Facilities. So the issue of suicide is complex and tragic in itself amongst the general population, um, but that complexity is enhanced amongst the prisoner population as an already vulnerable group with conditions for suicide and self-harm exacerbated by the experience of incarceration. So the question we wanted to look at is what is it about the prison experience that provides the conditions for suicide to be more likely to occur? What are some of these factors within the prison environment that are worth highlighting to agencies charged with looking after individuals during their period of incarceration that they need to be aware of to possibly limit or prevent the incidence of serious um, self-harm happening and suicide? So the ultimate question is what can we do to prevent such, such incidents occurring? It's just a very small scale um, exploratory project at this stage that we hope to build upon in the future. Um, it does though provide at least some insights into these questions. So, so just where we're heading with the presentation, I'll provide a review of the purpose of the study. I'll provide some reported statistics on prisoner suicide rates um, and self-harm amongst um, this particular cohort. I'll briefly touch on some of the literature which has identified some predictors and risk factors. I'll then go over the parameters of our study including the time period and the sample and go over the results and finish up with some other observations as a result of the analysis and then overall what, what some of these results may mean for policy and practice in this area. So the purpose of the study, so it's been well established in the literature that prisoners are at much higher risk of suicide than the general population and I'll come to those stats in the next couple of slides. However, understanding of the risk factors associated with suicide and serious self-harm within the prisoner population, while the body of literature is growing in this area, it's still relatively underdeveloped. Um, understanding in more detail what are the risk factors provides potential learnings in relation to suicide prevention and management of the risk of serious self-harm for correction, correctional agencies. Um, so just some statistics, um, prisoners have higher rates of suicides, typically three to five times the rate of that in the general population. Individuals who enter prison have more known risk factors for suicide than, than those in the general population, so they're already a very highly vulnerable group. Following release from prison, they remain at an elevated risk of suicide. Around a quarter of those entering prison have a history of self-harm. Other stats show that 4% of those released from prison report that they, self, they have self-harmed in prison, and 7% of entrants are identified as being at risk of self-harm or suicide. So I've just, um, just got a couple of charts to show you. So there's, as I said, the high rates of suicide in the prison um, compared with the general population. So you see along the line along the bottom is the Australian population and the, and the, the line along um, the top is the prison population. So um, the mean in the general population is around 1.6%, um, but over this time period it's about 35% um, in, um, in the prison population. You can though see that the rates are coming down, so we have had some success, Australia has, in reducing suicide. Um, that may, uh, suicide within prisons, it's possibly due to a range of factors. Um, for example, I've not shown it here, but the rates of self-inflicted deaths within custody for Indigenous offenders has actually been trending downwards. Um, 
It's possibly as a result of a lot of flow on work that's happened um, due to the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, which was completed in the early 90s. But there's been other physical changes within um, the prison cells to make things like hanging, which has historically been one of the main methods of self-inflicted death within custody, particularly for Indigenous offenders. Um, it's less likely now, so hanging points have been removed from um, a lot of prison cells, so, so that opportunity has um, have been removed. Um, so that said, well, you know, it's not really... It has been going down, but it's hard to say it's um, a good news story because it's still every single one of these um, deaths in custody by suicide is a, is a particular tragedy for all involved. Um, and just one other um, chart here just showing um, um, all, all deaths in custody, which is the darker darker blue line and then the proportion that are self-inflicted. So they self-inflicted deaths um, represent about a third of deaths in prison custody. So there's been a range of predictors and risk factors already identified in the literature. Um, so for example, the history of self-harm is a risk factor, but it doesn't actually need to be serious self-harm. A study by Horton um, looked at the differences in males and females and what were predictive factors for those. So for males, older, older males um, in the 30 to 49 age group and have had previous moderate or high lethality self-harm um, episodes prior are more likely to um, commit suicide. Females, if they're on a life sentence or again have had previous self-harm, have higher risks of suicide. Um, suicide rates are higher amongst those prisoners on remand or, or on sentence. And a study by Fazel, however, highlighted there's no association with rates of overcrowding, rates of um, ratio of prisoner to staff, prison capacity, the mean cost per prisoner per day, and the mean length of imprisonment um, as risk factors for suicide. Um, Another study, some of these are repetitive, but um, just further studies that have highlighted some of the risk factors. So a study by Mazzano um, highlighted a history of self-harm and attempted suicide in and out of prison, history of adverse life offence, um, family history of suicide, more negative experiences within prison, for example, um, higher levels of bullying, um, high suicidal intent, short periods in custody or in a current prison and... Um, experienced psychiatric disorders were all predictors of suicide. And then just finally, there's another interesting by Rivlin and colleagues which developed a typology of prisoners which highlighted such risk factors for near lethal suicide attempts as prisoners being unable to cope in prison. Um, they had psychotic symptoms such as hearing voices that were telling them to hurt or kill themselves or were experienced severe paranoia. Um, some had instrumental motives in that they didn't actually want to die but were making the attempt um, to get a certain outcome, uh, such as being transferred out of a cell to a more favourable cell, um, to what they perceived to be more favourable. Um, those where the suicide attempt was unexpected, so other otherwise apparently well-adjusted prisoners were overwhelmed um, in a short period of time by a series of life events inside and outside of the uh, prison. So to the prisoner themselves, the attempt was unexpected, unforeseen, or out of character. Or finally, this attempt was associated with withdrawal from drugs. So, um, so our study then drew on this literature to provide a framework for some um, of the possible predictors that we could look at for suicide or serious self-harm. So things that were identified in the literature, I've covered some of these, um, um, that were determinants in suicide, so age, so older age, ages in the 30s to 40s were more likely than that younger cohort. Um, gender, suicide rates for males is typically higher than for females. Um, indigenous status, uh, mental health, if they have had a mental health history and self-harm history. Time in custody, uh, suicide was more likely where an individual um, had been in custody for a shorter length of time. Um, a most serious offence or charge, so more individuals on more serious or violent offence charges come up in the literature as being a um, um, higher rate of suicide and, as I said before, being on remand or um, unsentenced. But then we thought about some other potential predictors that we wanted to include in um, what we were looking at. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just go through these quickly. So whether an individual was on their first experience within a custodial environment, their accommodation area, i.e. whether they're in the residential, which is uh, typically lower risk or there's less monitoring, or in secure crisis units, the medical units, um, maximum security units, etc. Whether the time of day um, showed any patterns in that with um, suicide attempts and um, completions whether they had or were about to experience a transfer from their current cell or centre, um, the level of monitoring they were under, um, they were at the time of the attempt, whether they were in a shared cell or in their own cell, um, whether, they were in a whether they were a protection prisoner or not. So protection prisoners are those who identify as needing some type of um, protection because they're at risk, either um, there's association issues within the prison, um, sex offenders, etc. Um, whether they've been on a safety order or not, um, whether flags have been raised on them, for example, cognitive impairment, or if they're a sex offender, whether they've had a history of substance misuse, significant recent stresses in their life, such as family conflict, um, relationship breakdown, media attention for the, their offence, whether they're receiving visits, um, we took that as a proxy for social and family support, um, and whether they had a history of experiencing um, sexual assault or abuse and the trauma of that, so that could have been as a child in an institution, as a youth, or within custody itself. Um, so our time period was two years from October 2016, just to try and get the latest data that we could on this. Um, data was extracted from our um, offender management system, IOMS, um, so when entering an incident into the system, um, the officers would use this particular definition of attempted suicide, i.e. that is self-harm that reasonably appears to have been intended to cause death or would have likely have caused death, death if assistance had not been rendered. And so that's what we extracted then um, and did that in a manual, manual process. We also checked medical emergency and self-harm incident data to ensure that no cases were missed. So for example, in some instances, um, Incidents were coded twice. They were coded as attempted suicide or self-harm. So it could be the case that it's sometimes difficult for an officer to determine whether it was attempted suicide or it was just a, a, an event of self-harm. So our resulting sample then um, was four completed suicides, of which three were male and one was female, and 134 attempted suicide in incidents, though that only count counts actually for 80 individuals, so there were some individuals had multiple suicide attempts. Oops, there we go. Um, so the analysis we carried out was only very exploratory and preliminary analysis at this stage, a lot of descriptive um, work we were looking at. The variables were most were categorically, uh, cat categorical. We first looked at comparing completed suicide incidents versus attempted, they were limited in the analysis that we could do on this because of the only small number of completed suicides who are, there are some um, interesting observations um, from those four particular um, events. Um, and we looked at the data another way, recoding um, individuals involved in the incidents by the level of serious, so taking their most serious recent um, attempt and then that allows us to do some comparisons of two groupings. So one of those of completed or extremely serious attempts, and we classed extremely serious attempts as those where the individual was hospitalised and no alert was made or the attempt was not seen by staff or other prisoners. And then another grouping um, were those who were serious but less so than the others. They weren't hospitalised. Um, and they made the alert or was done in front of staff or other prisoners. Um, we did um, regression analysis to assess the impact of a, a small number of variables of age, number of correctional episodes and days from admission to custody. And then we did a simple chi-square analysis um, to compare the two, um, two groups um, on a number of variables. So this is just a range of um, descriptive statistics we'll just go through here. So looking at the full number of incidents, that's, this is includes the completed suicides here um, and some of the trends in the incidents themselves. So the average time between admission to custody and the incident was 2.4 years. There's a, quite a large range, um, range of uh, time there. The time of day, just under two thirds occurred in the daytime just under one third in the evening and less than 10% occurred overnight. 
there was a higher proportion of the incidents occurring in centres with um, higher proportions of prisoners on remand, um, protection of vulnerable prisoners. And in considering the accommodation unit where the incident occurred, it was fairly evenly spread across um, to the secure units, detention units and the crisis safety medical units. And all these are areas where a prisoner um, would be accommodated if they were more at risk and they were under more monitoring. Only a small proportion occurred in the residential area of the prison. Um, and that's where I said before, residential areas, more prisoners have more freedom there. They've progressed to this type um, area typically because of good behaviour and are considered lower risk. Um, the location of the incident. So the overwhelming majority of the incidents occurred in the cell. However, only 15 of the 138 incidents were where an individual was in a shared cell. So most of the incidents occurred then where a prisoner was in, his cell, in a cell on his own. So that sort of gives rise to a need to give consideration to shared cells being a possible prote protective factor for suicide. There's, you know, there's so much talk about overcrowding in, in um, prisons and there's no doubt that that's a significant issue. Um, however, removing the double ups may actually cause other issues in some cases when you're talking about um, preventing suicide or self-harm. Um, the methods used of these, um, in, in these incidents, around a third for each of strangulation or asphyxiation, hanging, um, a slightly lower proportion there for laceration, such as cutting arms and necks, and there was a small proportion that tried other methods, such as choking, overdosing or um, headbanging. 33% um, were taken by ambulance and hospitalised, um, just under half alerted staff or made the attempt while being directly observed by staff. Two thirds of the incidents occurred while an individual was on a safety order. 91% of the um, incidents, um, the offender had a self-harm history flag. Um, the observations were an interesting finding for us. So two thirds were on some, sort, some form of observations with nearly half on high levels, so continuous or every 15 to 30 minutes. However, a third were not on any observation schedule at the time of the incident. So then we looked at the individual, at the individual personal uh, level, noting that these are just the ob some observations at the base, as the base size is so low, but there are some worth noting. So we had, as I said before, we had four individuals who successfully completed suicide, and they were generally older in age than the individuals who were non-completers, had been in custody for a shorter period of time and had generally fewer correctional episodes. I mean, the base size is really low, but it's just, just to highlight a couple, of, a couple of things from this. So when you're looking at the comparisons of these individuals of completers um, versus attempters, all four of the individuals that completed suicide did so in, when they were in their cell, they were on remand, their most serious offence was homicide and they had reported recent or current family issues. And three of these four individuals, um, the suicide occurred at night, they were in a secure unit, their method was hanging, um, they were not on any visual observations, their offence had attracted significant media attention and they were on a safety order. Um, alternatively, none of these four individuals raised an alert or did it in view of staff. None of them were Indigenous versus 32% of the, um, of the s attempters who were. None had a cognitive impairment, none had a history of sexual assault or abuse, um, none were protection prisoners and none were flagged as a sex offender. So we just wanted to just uh, present a couple of case studies um, just to highlight some of the issues that we've been ra uh, raising. So this was an a individual who successfully completed suicide tragically. Um, he was a male, age 33. He was on remand for attempted murder. There was significant media attention to this particular crime. Um, his method was in cell by hanging at 7.40 a.m. Um, he was on visual observations every two hours. He was on a safety order. It was his first time in custody and had been admitted six days prior to this, um, this successful attempt. He was withdrawing from amphetamines. Um, 
there was a court mentioned for charges and they were scheduled to, um, to be in one week after his, his suicide. He had a very serious suicide attempt with guns four days prior to entry into custody and this was in a police incident after his partner threatened to leave the relationship. And he'd also had a serious overdose three days prior, again in the context of a partner indicating the end of his relationship. Um, and then comparatively, um, a non-completed case study, but there are quite a lot of similarities between these two, two groups, uh, two individuals. It was a male, he was aged 40. He was sentenced for serious assault, resulting in injury. Um, his method was by strangulation in a maximum security unit. It was at 6.30 p.m. in the evening. He was on visual observations every hour and it was on a safety order. He was admitted to custody just under two years prior to the incident. This was his second correctional episode. He was on protection status, had a mental illness, substance misuse history and reported past sexual assault as a victim. He had a chronic painful physical disorder. He had upcoming court appearance in three months and he was quite anxious about that. And from the notes he'd, he'd said, I just can't do another five years in custody. I um, mean, he had a history of self-harm and serious suicide attempts, including hanging and cutting from a young age. He tried to shoot himself um, when inc incarceration was um, about to happen, but the gun misfired. So, so again, they highlight some of these risk factors um, and they were played out definitely in these two individuals. So as I said, we then looked at the data another way to try to get a picture of some possible predictors using a different grouping to create some larger sample size. So this was on the same 40, 84 individuals that I mentioned before. So firstly, age, um, the number of custodial episodes and the number of days between admission and incident did not predict um, seriousness of attempt. And for other variables, however, we did a simple chi-square analysis to ass assess if there are any significant differences between these groups. So I won't, I won't read all these out because I don't have time, but there were no significant differences between the two groups in terms of these variables listed here. So this was between the completed extremely serious attempters and the serious attempters. But for a small number of other variables, there were some significant differences. So again, the level of visual observations. Um, completers and serious attempters were less likely to be on observation, so that was interesting for us. Um, the history of mental illness, completers or the serious attempters were less likely to have had a history of mental illness. So by all appearances and prior diagnosis, they were generally, like, generally fine mentally. Um, they, um, again, completers and extremely serious attempters were significantly less likely to have had a history of substance misuse. And then... Um, Again, this, the more serious and the completer group were significantly more likely to be accommodated in residential and less likely in areas such as the tent detention crisis or MSU units. So effectively, these guys um, were flying under the radar and perhaps had even manoeuvred themselves deliberately out of these areas which were more um, highly monitored um, into somewhere they would be more likely to succeed in their attempt. So the study raised some other possible questions for us though, so some of which I've touched on already. So uh, I mean, are those prisoners who are more determined to end their lives, are they less likely to raise alerts and seem to work towards an opportunity to execute their plan and seemingly out of the blue? Nevertheless, there are some often other strong warning signs, so they're on remand for homicide. Um, they've had previous serious attempts using high lethality methods, for example, a gun. Um, they're often in their early weeks of admission, um, often their first custodial episode, so it's a huge adjustment to the stresses of this new harsh environment. Um, but also there's acute stresses involved in place, so family and relationship breakdown, there's upcoming court or have had recent court appearances, so there's a period of change or uncertainty about what's going to happen to them. The significant media attention typically related to, of course, the seriousness of, of the events. But may, that may mean a lot of things for a particular individual. So there might be intense shame and guilt for the offence that they've committed. They may have, in fact, killed someone that they loved. Um, family may have disowned them because of the severity of the offence. There's a lot of factors there. Um, the stresses and behaviours for completers seem to be more acute than chronic. So something may have just happened that's triggered the attempt. 
And these are hard to predict, so you know, they might have just had a phone call or they've had a visit from someone um, and had some family conflict. Um, finally, it's difficult to form clear typologies. There's an overlap between the serious and less serious behaviours in the same individual. And the literature con confirms this final point, that they're not mutually exclusive groups. So what then are the implications for policy and practice? And we've mentioned some here, though there's, um, there's many more, and I'll, I'll just list a few here. Um, there's an obvious need to focus on both the prisoner and system level factors, as well as individual level factors to find solutions to reducing suicide within a custodial environment. In respect to visual observation, consideration may need to be giving, given to performing irregular as well as regular observations and checks. Predictable intervals, for example, of one to two hours arguably, arguably allows too much opportunity. Um, high risk remandees may be better accommodated in appropriately shared cells until they are past that critical risk period. Um, another individual in a cell as a companion actually may be a protective factor for some individuals. There may be a need for intensive psychological case management of offenders at high risk of lethal self-harm, um, especially in the first three months and particularly when the prisoner is not yet well known to staff. But that then has resource implications which have to be managed at the prisoner level. Um, and more consideration, however, may need to be given to relationship breakdown or significant strain um, as a risk factor, particularly for females and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals. Now, and while I say this could be just for females, it actually could be for males. You know, they typically cope with such stresses by other activities such as drinking, drugs, hanging out with friends, driving fast cars. Well, um, but once they're incarcerated, the, the means of coping are drastically changed and reduced and their life is significantly restricted. So, plus they don't have those other coping mechanisms. So they can't just ring up a friend and this may... Um, you know, self-harm or suicide attempts may be the way um, that they um, release that stress, I guess. And finally, greater emphasis to be placed on holistic um, understanding and for the risk um, and protective factors at the individual level, taking into consideration the full spectrum of their circumstances like social factors, financial status, the physical well-being, cultural elements, any grief or loss, significant grief or loss in their family and the current mental... Um, or psychological state. Um, so, yeah, so that's it, really, but thank you for listening. Thank you. I was interested in the um, findings that you've got and you're focused on the, the risk factors mm -hmm. and you've identified one particular protective factor and mentioned the possibility of looking at those more at an individual level. Yeah. Have you considered protective factors at a prison management level in terms of from a prison administration context, yeah. things that corrective services can do in the way prisons are managed yeah. that can be protective? Yeah, and I mean, that's really what we tried to do with this study. I mean, the individual factors, are, there's a lot of literature on that about what, um, you know, can, you know, prevent an individual, um, um, you know, committing suicide. But um, what we wanted to do was look at things like where are they accommodated within a prison? Is that going to help um, or be a protective factor? Whether the doubling up was a real um, significant finding for us. Um, you know, it may be that they need to be in cells with other individuals, at least in that initial period. So that's really, that was really where we sort of, yeah, co tried to cover quite a few of those points that in there. Mm. Any other questions? Oh. I was just wondering whether the doubling up, well, it would be great if it was a causal effect, but I was just wondering whether mm. people who are intending to suicide avoid doubling up. I don't know. Yeah, Do yeah. they have control over it? Uh, maybe Sandy might be able to answer that, to, um, just from an operational perspective. Yeah. Yeah. 